All right, everybody. Hi there, and welcome to week four of Music Appreciation. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the characteristics of musical instruments. Very interesting topic. Uh, just a quick review. Last week, uh, we talked about phrase, form, and texture. Um, again, I like to think of these as kind of slightly more macro level ideas compared to what we've been talking about in uh, the weeks leading up to last week. Um, phrase is a segmentation of melody, so it's kind of like um, collections of notes together um, that end up making like a single musical thought. Forms are, again, like the macro-organized, large-scale musical ideas. Uh, with forms, we talk about whole pieces of music rather than specific measures. And then textures are groups of instruments. So the density of the sound is what we talk about with texture. All, all very kind of uh, large-form ideas with what we talked about last week. Um, this week, like I mentioned, we're talking about musical instruments. Um, when we look in the um, instructional package for the course, I think uh, the person maybe who wrote that really wanted us to look at, you know, the, the instruments you find in a common um, symphony orchestra, right? And those are great instruments, um, you know, the ones that uh, are, are very common to Western music. However, I thought it a better idea to talk about instruments in general and like families of instruments in general that apply to many sorts of different instruments rather than talking about a few a handful specifically um i'd, I'd rather give you the ideas and the concepts so you can be familiar with most instruments um rather than fewer um also the the wording in the instructional package is standard musical instruments and to be completely honest i think standard it changes a lot depending on context. Um, what is standard in a jazz combo is not standard in in um, a string quartet, right? And so it's. I thought it would be better just to to think about um, a range of instruments and a range of musical traditions when we're talking about these things, um, rather than again just a handful. So that's where I'm coming at with this, um, and hopefully, like I said, it will it will lead you to a better understanding of a larger number of instruments. So, the first ones we're going to talk about are stringed instruments. Stringed instruments. Um, and there are three major uh, kinds of a stringed instrument. The first one is part of the lute family, so on the far left. Um, these are instruments that the strings are supported between a neck and a body. So it's got two separate parts, a neck and a body, like a guitar. Right? And we fasten the strings up at the top on the neck, and they run all the way down the neck across the length of the body and are fastened usually somewhere near the bottom of the body of the instrument. Um, again, uh, the guitar is, is a very common one to keep in mind, um, but also the violin family, violin, viola, cello, bass, all fit into this lute um, uh, evolutionary kind of group of instruments. The second type are the harps. Um, so these are instruments that are contained within a, fr or the strings are contained within a frame. So if you look at this picture of the harp here, you can see that there is um, kind of a, what can either be a metal or a wooden frame built all the way around in a, cir er, in a circle or a triangle or in some sort of enclosed shape. And in the middle of that enclosed shape, you stretch a length of wire or string. Um, and that would be part of the harp family. Um, there, are, I, I only put harp there for example, uh, but there are many different kinds of harps um, from many different kinds of traditions, um, and and so I think that um, we we mostly all encompass them in harp. Um, there are more technical names, but um, it it changes depending on on where you're at. But that's the harp family, and then finally the zithers. Um, so these are instruments where it's like if you took the lute and you mounted the neck on top of the body, right? So the neck and the body are kind of just one piece. It's one frame. And so the strings are stretched over that frame. Um, so for these, we have things uh, like the dulcimer. Uh, the piano is uh, could be counted as the zither, the, a zither. You'll notice as we go on that the piano can actually be counted in lots of different families, depending on how we're thinking about it. Um, we'll, we'll talk about how it could fit into the percussive family a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so you can see here this dulcimer in the picture. Um, it's as if it's just one piece, it's one body, and the strings are stretched across that body. 
right? Um, there are different ways of playing stringed instruments depending on what it is. So you might pluck them like a mandolin or a guitar or a ukulele. You may bow them um, like an urhu or a viola. Um, of course, bows can also be used on the other stringed instruments, but we're talking about kind of common practice. And then we have the striking of the strings. Um, the piano, the harpsichord, certain Chinese instruments require you to um, strike the strings with mallets. Um, and so these are the most common ways. But of course, there is what we would call extended technique um, that would have you doing other things like scratching the strings, um, or um, moving other sorts of materials across the strings or, or um, kind of snapping the strings is another way um, that every once in a while you'll get a piece of music that calls um, for that sort of playing style. Um, with stringed instruments, it's important to keep in mind that sometimes we press on the strings to change the notes and other times we have more of a fixed tuning where one length of string can only play one note. Um, on, uh, in families like the lute family, we can easily change the note that a string plays by pressing it down onto the neck or onto the body. Uh, but with other uh, stringed instruments like those in the harp family, um, one st string is only going to give you one note. Uh, the harp does have some interesting features where with foot pedals you can actually press things down and change the note up or down by about a half step. But in essence, um, we can think of them as being fixed pitches. Okay, and so those are kind of the two differences. Uh, I've put some um, some pieces here you can listen to, uh, the, the Urhu that you can listen to, and then um, this wonderful um, piece for harp, uh, flute, clarinet, and string quartet by Ravel. Uh, so let's move on uh, to wood, wind, and brass instruments, our wind instrument family. Um, so when we think of wind instruments, they fall into two categories, either brass or woodwinds. Brass instruments date back a long, long time uh, to the ancient Greeks and Romans, or even before. Um, but kind of our modern brass instruments start to evolve more around uh, the 14th century. Um, so with Brass and woodwind instruments, they are requiring the, um, the instrumentalist to blow into the instruments. The technique is different, and the embouchure, or the kind of shape and, um, and uh, technique for playing with the mouth um, that the player will use is different across all these instruments. But it is important to keep in mind, as the name suggests, that with wind instruments, um, we are blowing into these instruments. Um, brass instruments, of course, include the trumpet, the tuba, the trombone, on and on and on. There's um, many different uh, members of that family. And then the woodwinds um, fall into, again, kind of like three categories here. Um, so just like the strings had categories, the woodwinds do too. Some of them have no reed at all, um, like the flute and the panpipes. Um, some of them have a single reed, a clarinet or a saxophone, and others have a double reed, the cor anglais, uh, the oboe, the bagpipe. Um, uh, occasionally we have something that we would call free reed. They're not really reeds in, in, in the traditional sense of being like a small, thin piece of um, like uh, fibrous, woodish material. Um, but the harmonica and the accordion do technically fall into this woodwind uh, category uh, because of the mechanics of, of the instrument. Um, I put a video here of Damar McGill. He is the principal flautist. Um, for my local um, symphony orchestra, the Seattle Symphony, um, playing a little bit of Debussy there so you can get a feeling for that kind of no reed flute sound from the woodwinds. So woodwinds and reeds, we've been mentioning a reed, so I have two pictures here on the left of a single reed and on the right of a double reed. Um, while not all woodwind instruments use reeds, it's worth knowing the difference between the two types. So single reeds are attached to a mouthpiece. Um, uh, you can use all sorts of um, uh, ligatures to, to hold them onto the mouthpieces. Um, and basically, you, you send a stream of air that causes that reed um, to vibrate the air, to disrupt the airflow that you're doing, and it vibrates up and down, and that creates the sound against the mouthpiece. Um, double reed instruments are slightly different, so they you actually blow the wind in between the reeds. Um, it reminds me of like... When I was a kid, some people would take like long 
pieces of grass and they would kind of blow on them a certain way. And as the piece of grass that you folded over um, would vibrate against itself, it would create this like sound and you could almost play it. So it's a similar idea. You're blowing the sound in between. Uh, double reed instruments tend to have a very unique characteristic. Um, it's a lovely sound, um, but it, it can um, sound a little like honk, you know, kind of like it, had, it does have a very, some people say nasally sound. Um, composers typically use double reed instruments due to their like unique character to um, to symbolize characters or like change or, or new musical thought and ideas. Uh, they're often solo instruments, which is great um, because of their like unique timbre and their ability to really cut through an orchestra. Um, so double reed instruments are great. Um, and which moves us on to our brass instruments. Valves, slides, keyed or natural, all sorts of brass instruments. Um, so when you look at a brass instrument, it's got all these twists and turns and pipes. Um, I remember I think my first ever exposure to a brass instrument was probably um, at Christmas time on our Christmas tree. We had like these um, brass, you know, they look like French horn ornaments that went on the tree. And I always wondered, like, why do they need all those pipes? Like, what is all that about? And so in general, the reason there's so many pipes and there's twists and turns in the pipes is because the longer the pipe, the deeper the pitch in general, and the smaller the pipe or shorter the pipe, um, the higher pitch. And so a depending on the way the instrument works, you can manipulate those lengths of uh, pipe in order to get the pitches that the player wants. Um, some Sometimes brass instruments do this with valves or slides, and sometimes they use even keys, which are very uncommon. Um, or, like we noted back in um, Greek and Roman times, almost all, like all brass instruments, not almost all, all, to my knowledge, were natural brass. So that means that uh, there was no way to change the length of pipe, uh, so you were limited to fewer notes. Um, valved brass instruments use a set of valves, often operated by your fingers uh, to change varying lengths of tubing. So you can think about the trumpet, uh, you can think about the tuba. Slides allow the user to dynamically change uh, the length of, of tubing by moving a slide. So like a trombone, as you slide it out, you can change your notes um, or pull it back in. Keyed brass instruments, like I mentioned earlier, they are very unusual and they are kind of like a hybrid between the woodwinds and the brass um, because you um, press down keys like you would find on a flute or a clarinet or a saxophone um, and they cover, um, these little keys operate pads that cover small holes in the instrument. They're really unique, uh, interesting looking instruments. Um, if you get a chance, go on YouTube and search like keyed trumpet and they're, they're really cool but rare and rarely played uh, anymore. Uh, and then finally, we have natural brass, which, like I mentioned, it's one length of tubing, and you change notes purely based on the air pressure and on the overtone series um, is what you can get. Um, I want to shout out uh, Dizzy Gillespie, born in, who knew, Shiraz, North or South Carolina, our very own Shiraz, South Carolina, um, back in 1917, one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time one of America's finest trumpeters, uh, composers, band leaders. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to hear uh, Dizzy Gillespie play some trumpet, A Night in Tunisia, great piece, live performance. Um, check it out. And we arrive at the percussion family. So um, I think it's important to note that aside from the human voice, which was obviously our first instrument, um, percussion instruments are most likely the oldest, and that's because... Um, at its root, a percussion instrument is one object vibrating against another object or um, putting one force upon an object to make it vibrate or make a noise um, in some way. Um, and so you can imagine cavemen beating rocks together um, or, or noticing you know, that when they manipulated something it made a sound. Um, this was our first uh, percussion instruments. Uh, so there are, just like there is different um, types of string instruments and different types of wind instruments, of course, there's different methods and different kinds of percussion instruments. And so, I've, again, I've broken them into 
categories and into families rather than talking about a handful of instruments. This way I think you can understand a larger group. So the four types that I talk about are the ideophones, and these are uh, percussion instruments that involve vibrating the entire body of the instrument. So I put the uh, vibra slap up there. So um, when you use that, you um, the little wooden ball on the end of the wire um, shakes against the uh, and strikes the wooden block at the bottom, but the entire instrument is moving when you do this. Um, we have membrano phones, which we commonly think of as drums. Um, they produce a sound when you strike the membrane or, or the skin, we might call it on a drum. So if we look over at the djembe or you think about a snare drum or quads or whatever, um, they vibrate based on that membrane or that head um, being struck. Uh, chordophones are stringed uh, percussion hybrid instruments, so again, like the grand piano, um, and they operate when a string is struck. Um, so the way the piano operates is even though it's a bunch of lengths of strings stretched um, in a very like um, uh, zither-like fashion between uh, like kind of bolted to a body, when you hit that key, it operates a tiny mechanical uh, device which moves a felted hammer which strikes a string. Um, and because of this like striking motion, um, we think of it as a percussion instrument as well as a stringed instrument. And then finally, aerophones are kind of, as far as uh, chordophones are string percussion hybrids, aerophones are kind of a, a, a wind percussion hybrid. Uh, so they include sirens and whistles. Um, and even though these involve often like blowing into them, um, they're often given to um, percussionists to play during a, a work. Um, there's also the udu, which is a really interesting uh, instrument that's almost like a uh, like a clay uh, vessel or a pot or something with a hole in the side and a hole in the top. And when you strike it with your hand, it forces air through the instrument. And so we kind of think of it as one of these aerophones uh, because of the amount of wind that's used in operating it. Uh, I thought that the udu was such an interesting uh, instrument that I put a video here that I highly encourage you to watch. Um, I think, you know, when we think of percussion instruments, I think membranophones are the ones that we really think about. Um, and I think there's like a common method. Um, and of course, the, the method for playing drums is exhaustive, and we're not going to di deep dive into it. But I think there is a common uh, technique that can be seen across most uh, of the membranophone family. Um, and that is kind of the idea that where you strike the membrane matters to the sound. Um, I, I noticed that when I've worked with beginning percussionists in the past that they think that every spot on the drum is going to make the same sound. And, and very quickly we find out that that's not the case. Um, that if you strike along the rim of the instrument, it makes a very different sound than a few inches in, which is a very different sound than the absolute center of the membrane. Um, I've put a video here that kind of explains all of that, but I think it is important um, when we're thinking about drums and membranophones that we don't take for granted all of the um, technique that's involved in playing these instruments. Uh, and mallet percussion. Uh, so the first mallet percussion instruments date back millennia. You know, we're talking a long time ago. Uh, but they didn't really start making their way into um, the symphony like we know them now um, until about the 1800s. So mallet percussion instruments are melodic, uh, ideophones, uh, because the entire body of the instrument uh, vibrates when you uh, strike them. Um, and they include the entire family of xylophones and glockenspiels um, uh, uh, that, that are involved like kind of you holding a stick or a mallet and, and striking a, um, uh, a bar. Uh, sorry, I was also thinking of marimbas um, are included in this family as well. Um, many mallet percussion instruments are tuned chromatically, so they have the 12 uh, step chromatic uh, scale that we learned, I think, in the first week, or kind of um, alluded to, uh, but others, depending on the origin or the um, culture that they're sitting within, they may be tuned differently, so not just a straight chromatic scale. 
Um, I put a video here of the balafon, um, which is a, an African uh, traditional instrument. I think it's really interesting because in the same way that a um, marimba or certain xylophones use um, resonating uh, pipes that hang below the instrument to allow you to um, manipulate the sound or sustain the sound, um, the balafon has these gourds, kind of dried out gourds, that are underneath each um, tile that you strike. Um, and when you strike it, it, it vibrates that gourd, and sometimes there might be something inside of the gourd that will um, shake and rattle, um, and it adds to it a very unique character, um, as well as like a slight amount of, of reverb to allow for a, a sustain to the instrument. Um, and then finally, we have the keyboard instruments. Um, keyboard instruments are one of my absolute favorite. I think they're just uh, such an interesting um, instrumental family because of all the technology that goes into them. I think every time that an, a new keyboard instrument has come around, it's 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 signified a uh, a step forward for mechanics and for engineering. Um, these are really uh, mechanical instruments. They are, if you look at kind of the family tree and the way they evolved, they also tell us a lot about, um, at least in Western music, a lot about like the, what was going on in the rest of music at the time. Um, so for instance, the, uh, the, the piano that we know today hasn't always been around. Um, it, it had many earlier iterations with the clavichord and with the harpsichord and so on. Um, if you look inside a piano today, it has three strings for every note, and that, again, hasn't always been the case. For a long time, it was only one note. Um, we see the modern-day piano. Um, what made it special at its time is it wasn't always called the piano. For a long time, it was called the piano forte. And that's because, of course, as you might remember, the musical terms piano means soft, and the musical term forte means loud. And the reason we they called it the piano forte in the beginning was because this was the first keyboard instrument that had the ability to di change dynamics. Up until this point, the harpsichord and the clavichord were one volume instruments, right? The only way you could make something louder on those instruments was by adding more notes uh, or softer was by taking away notes. But with the piano for the first time, depending on how hard I uh, press the key, I can control the sound and, and the dynamic of the um, piece that I'm playing. Um, and this signaled a huge change uh, moving forward in, in Western musical composition. For the first time, we start to see m much more expressive when it comes to um, the dynamics and the and the volumes of songs. They, they just start to go through the roof, whereas before it was either play this loud or play this soft. Now we start to see lots of nuance, lots of... Um, sudden growth and sudden uh, diminishment in, in, in what we're hearing. And it's, a, it's just a really interesting history. Um, if you're interested, email me. I can recommend some great books uh, to look into. But just such an interesting um, instrument. Um, as your book notes, um, one of the earliest keyboard instruments, the hydralus, dates back uh, to ancient Greek times, uh, which is super cool. Um, you'll notice that we've left out vocal music. Uh, I have very good reason for this. I think, um, for, so first and foremost, voice is an instrument. Uh, one of my degrees is in voice. I think it's a very important instrument. Um, but um, our kind of instructional package wanted us to talk about um, uh, instruments out with of the human voice. And so um, we're going to talk about vocal music a lot um, once we start getting into our time periods um, uh, of Western music, um, the voice obviously also is really great because, as we said earlier, it's the first instrument ever. Um, and because of that, we'll have a lot of context um, in, in many different cultures to talk about the importance of vocal music. So the voice is an instrument, um, a very important instrument, um, but we'll be talking at length about it later. Um, yeah, so uh, here's some Leotine Price. Again, one of the greatest uh, voices of all time. Uh, check it out. Um, enjoy listening. Um, and we'll get to vocal music at a different time. Here's your key terms um, that were, as always, very useful for your test. Um, and some listening examples. Um, so I have labeled these 
according to whether I think, um, you know, it's a, I really want you listening to the strings or the winds or the percussion part in particular, um, that Steve Reich is very interesting and I think a challenging piece to listen to, but, but definitely well worth it. I put some Carolina Crown on here. Um, let's see, what all did I put on here? Uh, Goat Rodeo Sessions, a great um, group, super group that has just put out a new album. Uh, Sanj, uh, Cavalier Jean Georges is, um, is really great, uh, little known composer, French composer. Um, around Mozart's time, uh, his string quartet is great. Highly recommended. Uh, Corey Henry in the Funk Apostles, incredible. Check it out. Um, so hope, I hope you guys really enjoy listening to this. In in each of these or in many of these pieces, there are things going on other than exactly what I'm asking you uh, to listen to. Um, but I want you to really, if you can, um, as you audiate and as you listen, I want you focusing in on on those particular features. Okay. Um, I hope this helps. Um, I hope you guys are having a great week. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please shoot me an email, kyle.berry at hgtc.edu. Otherwise, uh, good luck on your quiz um, and have a good one.